and really do good with the time today. We have um, a session before us today, a lesson that's going to be a continuation of what we've had in the past on things to consider. And there is is quite a bit I want to try and plow through. Um, so I want us to turn our Bibles to Psalm 50. It's just uh, difficult to get through this without reading the whole thing. So please, let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 50. We're going to read that entire chapter. And we just ask the Lord to, to guide us through. So I'll read it in your hearing from the King James this morning. Psalm 50. The mighty God, even the Lord, had spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God had shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will, not, I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts and of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statues, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, when thou consentest with him, and hadst been partaker with adulterers, thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thee. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso authoreth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you one more time for your word. We thank you that you are with us, Lord, to, to bless and to speak to us today. We're asking that your presence would remain with us in this place. Give us inspiration and speak to our hearts, Father. Encourage us and cause us to know today what we have in you and how to be thankful for the things that you have already done. I thank you for causing your presence to move powerfully in each and every home as we apply your words to our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Praise the Lord. So we thank God again for his words. We've just read through Psalm 50, and um, it's a psalm of Asaph. And we may, may see that on a few of the psalms. I think there's a section here that belongs to Asaph. I think from chapter 73, we see a whole uh, section of the psalms dedicated to him. But here we have a particular psalm from Asaph, and he's not just a musician. Um, he's not just a composer and a choir leader, but Second Chronicles 29 verse 30 also calls him a seer, so he was prophetic. Um, that's important because we can see in this psalm that there's a, there's a bit of a switch in the middle. Um, he starts out by just giving God glory and, and, and saying things about God and about Zion. And then we have 
this sailor moment in verse six, and then God starts to speak. So he starts to prophesy. Um, and he says from there, uh, hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against the eye of God. So there's a switch that happens in the psalm. It's not just Asaph giving God praise, but we can see where the Lord intervenes and begins to speak. And this psalm is referred to as a covenant lawsuit where the Lord is the shortcomings of Israel and then justifies his judgment against them. And yet in this psalm, the Lord reveals the simplicity of what he requires and shows the kind of people that will be blessed. And so even though it feels quite heavy in the middle, you know, where he's taking out this injunction against Israel and, and, um, and, and kind of showing them how upset he is with their behaviors, there's a lining in here that for us, I think we, we should take some positivity away from. As the teacher was saying this morning, we don't want to just be focusing on the negative, but let's see how we can be positive and how we can take the word of God and live. So the key verse then is, is verse uh, 22, and it's, it's quite a, a hard verse, but he says, now consider this. And this is the, the theme of what we're looking at, the considerations of the scriptures. Consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Well, what a, what a strong statement to be made. Um, so this address to the forgetful, although it sounds harsh, it actually is to serve as a res what I call a restorative reminder to prevent the destruction of those who have become what I would say is formulaic in their sacrifice. So he's speaking to saints, he's speaking to the people of God, and he's saying, look, you're in danger of, you, of seeing my wrath. You're in danger of getting the worst of me. And so I want you to think about what I'm saying in this in this address. I want you to really pay attention because it's not really God's desire to destroy. It's not his desire to tear people in pieces. Um, but he's saying here, look, remember, I want you to remember what it is I'm about to show you. And so I want to reflect on a few verses in here and just hone in on, on, on this, you know, the two sides to this psalm. Um, he, he, he addresses the saints in verse five, and he says, gather my saints together unto me, and those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now that sounds good to start with, but it leads into an indictment. But we should also remember um, that it's, it's better to be rebuked in the hands of the Lord. You know, it's better to be in God's hand and being corrected than to be out in the world and receiving, you know, eternal damnation and judgment. So even though at times the corrections of the Lord, as the scripture says, I believe in Hebrews, you know, they don't seem joyous. Being rebuked doesn't make us happy. But the Lord says, you know, gather my saints together. There, there are a set of people out there who are in covenant with me. I want to speak to them because we, as people of God, who are in covenant with God, who have accepted Christ, um, we don't always do everything right. And every now and then we have to come together and just hear what the Lord has to say about our perfection and how we can, how we can move upward and how we can stop doing things that are displeasing to him. And so I begin to look at this, well, what is, what is the definition of a saint? Because if you look at the, what I would say, secular points of view or Roman Catholic point of view, they, they talk about saints as people who, you know, you know, go down in history as being great people, you know? And so um, they, they determine, oh, this person is a saint after years after they're dead. Uh, well, thank God, that's not God's definition of a saint. He said, it's those who have come into a covenant agreement. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And so I begin to look at these two elements of that, that we've come into an agreement with Christ. And there's also a personal cost. You know, the followers of Jesus Christ, um, we, we have not just decided to follow a philosophy as such. There is a price to be paid and there is a covenant that we come into. This is, this is not just a religion. There is, there's an agreement that has been made and that we come into with Christ when we look at his sacrifice and we consider and begin to understand what that means for us. You know, Paul speaks about us now being the righteousness of God and that we have been declared righteous. Well, how do we... How do we become righteous? It's not really by the works that we do. It's by believing that the sacrifice of, God, of, of Christ was enough to redeem us from sin. It's accepting that he, he took the penalty, um, the final penalty, which is death, you know, eternal damnation, that Christ stood in our place, that what he was doing on the cross was taking away the need for us to die eternally. I have to accept that. There's nothing else that brings me into righteousness other than 
believing, what Paul calls the hearing of faith. I hear that what Christ did on the cross was on my behalf, and I enter into that just by believing. So simple, all right? But, but there's a, still a price that has to be paid by me. There's still a, a cost that has to be paid by the individual. And then thirdly, there's an ongoing requirement. So I want to look briefly at, you know, what is the agreement? What is the price? And what's the ongoing requirement that, that Christ really makes of us? And I haven't said it yet, but the theme for today is really cultivating an attitude of gratitude. And we'll show you why I believe this psalm is really pointing towards thanksgiving. First of all, though, the agreement that was made, the agreement that we come into, we go back to, the, to Ezekiel and, and, we, and we look at there the promise that was made to um, those who would come in under the new covenant. And I know some people just focus this squarely on Israel, but what we're looking at here is the salvation experience. It's actually what happens to us when we come to Christ. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. He says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Praise God. This is you know, a powerful verse for us as believers. Uh, we, we see that Christ is doing all the actions in here. Salvation is all about what Jesus does to us and for us. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put a new spirit within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you. This is all the I wills of God under the new covenant. Under the old covenant, it was all about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And, and, and Israel found that difficult. And the Lord knew they would find it difficult because without a change of heart, you can't really change your actions. Yeah, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, you know, people act out of the evil deeds that are in their heart. You know, it, it's the heart that's the problem. And the, the Lord knew this all along. And so the promise for those of us coming in via the new covenant was that I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit, he says, I'll put within you. And some people look at that first line and says, oh, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, no, because he says in verse 27, I'm going to put my spirit in you. And so our spirit is renewed. We are born again. We are made new, right? It's, just, it's when the woman at the well, she had an experience before the Holy Spirit was even poured out. She had one meeting with Jesus and she ran away, a new woman. She ran away and began to testify. Something happened in the process of accepting Christ. She was born again. But then there's the, the power of the Spirit that makes us able to really continue in the ways of God because he says, you're going to hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. So we need not only a new heart and a new spirit, but we also need the Holy Spirit to guide that new spirit, to lead us in the way of everlasting life. And he says what the spirit does is he causes us, he helps us to walk in the word, to walk in the statutes and to keep his judgments and he empowers us to do them, takes us to what Paul said to the Philippian church, that it is Christ in you, but working both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the spirit of God in me is creating desire and the spirit of God in me is motivating me. Why? Because at, at times the, 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 my spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I need another spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to empower my spirit, to refresh my spirit, to give me the power to do the things that the Lord would have me to do. We can preach the word all day long and, and without an internal spark, without the spirit of God really moving in you, something happens. This is why I love coming together to worship, because even without a word, the spirit of God in worship motivates the heart. How many of you have been in service before and it wasn't just what the preacher was saying, but in the moments of worship, your spirit was refreshed. In the moments of worship, you got a vision for what to do in the coming week. I love it when we come together because in his presence, there are so many answers poured out as the saints begin to worship. It's the spirit of God refreshing us, inspiring us and causing us to walk in the statutes of God. So this is part of God's agreement, the new covenant. This is what he would do for us. And Paul says, we come in by believing, by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. It's all about what God has given to us. So when, God, when the Lord says, gather those um, unto, gather my saints unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, if we were to put this and point this toward the New Testament, the covenant is this new covenant. We are coming to accepting Christ as Lord, as sovereign, as Savior. Isaiah 59, 
21 also speaks about another aspect of this new covenant, touching more on the, on the spirit of God and, and his word in our mouth. He says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words that I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, save the Lord from henceforth and forever. So we have this confidence that the same spirit that was upon even the prophet Isaiah, because the Bible says it was the spirit of Christ through the apostle Peter that was signifying through the prophets what would happen to Christ and, and, and what would happen in, in terms of his life, his death and his suffering, his crucifixion. It was the spirit of Christ signifying in the prophets. So he's saying that the same spirit that was on you, here's the covenant I'm making. It's going to be the same spirit that's up on them. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The same spirit of God came upon them and they begin to preach the word of the Lord. Amen. They begin to speak inspired words. And the same spirit that fell upon them at the day of Pentecost is the same spirit that is upon us. And the same words that were in their mouth is the same word that's in our mouth. Okay, so this was God's agreement with us. This is his promise to us. We are those people. But what is the cost? The cost. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The cost for us today is self-denial. And I'm also adding self-examination. Luke 9, verse 23, 24 and he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Okay, so on the one hand, I have that Christ is doing all these good things for me. He's taking the stony heart out of my flesh. He's putting his spirit within me. He's causing me to walk in his ways. But now he's saying, but if you're, if you're going to follow me, here's what you need to do. You need to pay a price. You need to deny yourself. You need to take up your cross. And I, I, I choose Luke's version because Luke is the only one that has the word daily in there. You know, the ones that say take up your cross. But I like this daily because it's letting us know that every day we're living in flesh. And every day measures have to be taken to keep your flesh killed and to keep your flesh under subjection and to ensure that the old you and the old ways don't dominate and rise up within you. And so he says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Praise the Lord. So here's what we have to, there is a cost, the life you might've been setting out on a certain course in life. And the Lord has a completely different course for you. You might've decided you want to retire somewhere in the sun and you want to do this, but God says, no, you're going to work for me until I'm finished with you. So all the things and the plans that we have sometimes in place, when we decide that we're going to deny ourselves, we open up ourselves to the purposes of God. We open up ourselves to the will of the Lord. And yes, it comes at a cost, but, but, but this is a cost and a price many of us would much rather pay, much rather live a life for Christ and go to heaven and get a good reward than to live a life for myself and not hear well done at the end of my time. And so there is these two things. He does a lot for me. He's given me many exceeding great and precious promises. But my sacrifice to him is that I have to really give myself completely. There's another thing I want to look at here, and it's the self-examination. Because, you know, sometimes we read over the scriptures and it starts talking about the wicked. And it says, you know, and so God says to the wicked in verse 16. And we often don't see ourselves as wicked. And I hope we're not wicked. But the biblical definition of wicked when it comes to the saints is not, is not the same as, as, as this, the word might seem wicked. We will think of somebody as wicked as being pure evil, you know, and they have, they have evil intentions and they only desire to do, to do evil things. But it's not so in the scriptures. And I'm going to start reading from the easy to read version from verse 16 down and, 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 and show us uh, what wickedness is in the Bible. He says, but to the wicked... Stop quoting my laws. Stop talking about my agreement or the covenant. So he's saying, you're just talking. You don't have a right to quote my word because you're not even trying to live it. He says in 17, you hate me. You hate for me to tell you what to do. You ignore what I say. And so many people, they don't want to go to hell. They, they do want to go to heaven, but they don't want to be told by the word of God what to do. God said those people are wicked. 
They talk about the word, they talk about the covenant, they talk about salvation, they talk about being a Christian, but yet they don't want to do what God says to do. It was expressed through the prophet Isaiah in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. This man being Christ Jesus, they love him. They'd say, yes, you know, we, 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 wanna, we wanna wear our own clothes, we wanna eat our own food, but one thing you let us do, just let us be called by your name. I wish I'd included that in my scriptures this morning. In the early parts of Isaiah, one of his prophecies, seven women will take hold of one man. And this is what happens in Christendom. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. And in fact, you won't even find a religion except for Satanism that truly puts down Jesus Christ. Most religions want a piece of him. Most religions want to claim something uh, about this Jesus. The Hindus will say he's a good man. The Muslims will call him a prophet. Very few people just try to throw Jesus in the rubbish heap because there's, there's too much about him that's good to deny him. It's Isaiah 4 verse 1. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own bread. We will wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name. Why? To take away our reproach. People know that the name of Jesus is a name that can take away reproaches. People want to live any kind of Christian life. Just let me have the name of Jesus, but don't tell me what to eat. Don't tell me what to wear. And I'm talking spiritually now. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He is the food. He is the sustenance. And the Bible speaks about the apparel of the believer as being the righteousness of saints in Revelation. So when it speaks about the, the, the apparel, it's talking about character. It's talking about nature and behavior, right? So people, they don't want to be told how to live, how to behave. He says, you, you folks are wicked because you have my word in your mouth, but you don't actually want to live by it. He says, you see a th thief and you run to join him. You jump into bed with those who commit adultery. You say evil things and tell lies. Those things can be quite easily seen as wicked. But here about verse 20, he says, you sit around talking about people, finding fault with your own brothers. And when you did these things, I said nothing. So you thought I was just like you, but I will not be quiet any longer. I will correct you and make clear what I have against you. And there comes a time where the Lord, you know, he's, he's, he's now honing in on the details of our behaviors and saying, look, I didn't say nothing for a while, but this is what's upsetting me. You know, people think that God isn't around anymore because they're not dropping dead like Ananias and Sapphira who, who cheated the money, understand? But there comes a time when the Lord says, I want, I want to, to examine the detail of what I'm having an issue with because I actually I don't want you to die. So that's, that's the definition of the wicked in the Psalms. In 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, the Lord says again, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves afraid and turn from their wicked ways, so we as people of God can have wicked ways. In Matthew 25 and verse 26, he says to the man who buried his talent, you are wicked and slothful. These are all people of God. And so I'm encouraging us that we want to examine ourselves, that we don't fall on the side of those who are wicked. So part of the price we have to pay is examining ourselves and saying, Lord, search me. I hope I don't fall on the side of the people that you call wicked. But I want to move to what I think is the silver lining in this psalm. When he speaks about the, the ongoing requirement of the saints, he says in verse 13 to 15, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? He says, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows to the most high and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me he's given out his instructions of how simple it is to to live a godly life and a life that's pleasing to god he's, he's highlighted everything that's wicked but there's this lining of here's what i want from you offer to me thanksgiving pay your vows and call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee now, i want to talk a little bit about this thanksgiving and try and break it down. So, you know, the Thanksgiving offering, we, we first see it coming in the book of Leviticus, and there's lots of rules given around Thanksgiving and the offerings and how it should be offered. 
And Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving offering was actually part of the peace offering. And the peace offering <coughs> has three parts to it. The first element is Thanksgiving. And you can see this in Leviticus chapter 7 from around verse 12. You'll see it also in Leviticus 22. Thanksgiving is part of the peace offering. Sacrifice, the sacrifice of a vow is also part of the peace offering. That's where people make promises to God. I'll do this for you. Okay, and the third part of the peace offering is the free will offering. So this is a voluntary um, praise and a voluntary sacrifice to the Lord. All of these would always come after other sacrifices were offered. I want us to really step back and think about this. Paul says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And having peace with God is a big part of our Christian walk. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that so many don't walk around having peace with God and you can see they don't have peace with God because they never feel satisfied and they never feel like they're ever doing enough. Unfortunately, some of us are in a type of Christianity where we are measuring everything by our works and we constantly punish ourselves for the works we didn't do. And actually we don't give God thanks enough for everything he said he will do and everything that he is to us. And I, I wanna just quickly go back to those covenants because I don't think we thank him on these things enough. I don't think we thank him for a new spirit enough. I don't think we thank him for the spirit that he's put within us. I don't think we thank him for the words that he's promised that would be passed down to us. We're often focusing on everything we don't have. And, and, and we're often not focusing on even spiritual things. And we, we get caught up in a material mindset and worried about all these things in the natural and we have not acquired enough of the promises that he made for us in the spirit going back to the teaching where he says that he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness some days saints we just need to run through the list of the things that god has promised us and just thank him for them we need to run through all of his benefits. I believe it's Psalm 103 that says, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Sometimes we just need to run through the benefit list and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for your peace in my life. You know, and sometimes we don't even see the things that we're thanking him for, but because he promised it in his word, you still have a right to give him thanks because he can't lie. Thank him that he can't lie. Praise God. And so these three free will offerings um, or these three parts of the peace offering would always come after sacrifices were offered. And I want to just give us a bit of insight here because when your heart is not in your sacrifice, you can become a minimalist. What do I mean by that? So if the, if the church says, make sure we're in church every Sunday and make sure we turn up for prayer meeting on a Tuesday or whatever it is. Sometimes we, we take everything that the church is asking us to do as all that we have to do for God. And we become minimalist. Church is there to refire us to go away and be the church every other day of the week. Church is there to inspire us to be God's hand extended after Sunday. It's there to fire us up. It's there to inspire us. And then we come back and we meet and we say, Saints, I was you know, witnessing and working with somebody this week. Their name is so-and-so. Pray for me because I'm going back for them this week. I'm going to be encouraging them some more. I'm going to be giving them a phone call. Right? We, we come to encourage each other in the things of God as saved people. But when your heart is not in your sacrifice, you think that church is it. And when church is over, I go home and I'm waiting for the next service. Can't wait for the next service. The next service is between you and the Lord. Praise God. It's the next prayer meeting that you have on your own. It's the next time you start making melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's because you have peace with God. When you're at variance with God, you, you can't have fellowship with him. You can't walk and talk with him if, if you're not at peace with him. And so when the heart is not in the sacrifice, it's like, I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to do the bare minimum. Nothing flows out voluntarily. No vows are made. Nothing is added out of interest. It's like the person that goes to a restaurant. They're not happy with the service. They don't want a tip. There's nothing over and above. This peace offering was really about giving God what I want to give him as an expression of my heart. So when I'm in a service and, and the preachers preach, 
And I know the scripture says we shouldn't vow foolish vows and we shouldn't vow in a hurry, but, but we're meant to feel inspired to make new promises to God when we hear the word of God. The word of God requires a response from the believer. Something must flow out of you. I need to worship until I want to give God something for free. I want to tell him thank you just because it tasted so good, just because it felt so good to be in his presence. I want to make another vow. Sometimes we're in a service and we say, man, I'm going to give more. I'm inspired to give more. I've been, I've been holding back even on my offerings. I'm going to start giving more because I believe in this particular mission. I want to give to this particular cause and no one has to make me do it. I'm going to do it freely. God loves those kind of things. And so this is what he's really asking for. This is what he's indicting Israel for. He says to them, look, do I really want the flesh of bulls? You, you think it's food for me? He says, no, offer thanksgiving, pay your vows. Speak from your heart to the Lord. The vows are not something that the priest puts in your mouth. The vows are not something that somebody tells you to repeat. Make your vow. Tell God, this is what I'm going to do for you. And he says, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Paul says in the, to the Thessalonians, he says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Thessalonians 5.18 Thanksgiving is, is part of our New Testament walk. We need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Thank him, thank him, thank him. When people want to put misery and, pray, and, 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 and heaviness in your lips and murmuring and complaining, praise God instead. I want to ask us, what's the last vow that we made? What's the last promise that we made? Sometimes I find when I go into fasting, God always points me back to the last thing I promised him or the last thing he told me to do. One place he said, I require the things that are past. Sometimes God has given us stuff to do and it's sitting on the shelf and we, we haven't performed those vows yet. What vows have we made? And when was the last time we said, Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Lord, I'm willing to go the extra mile. I'm willing to pray for that one. I'm willing to visit that one. I'm willing to call that one. Verse 22, is, as he wraps up this, he says, consider this, consider this. That's what he wants us to consider. We're now at the end. He wants you to consider what it means to be wicked and what it means to, to, to give to God voluntarily. He's not asking for all the sacrifices. We can get caught up with the sacrificial part of salvation, with the religious side, with the part that everybody else sees. But he says, I want you to consider this if you have forgotten me. Those of you who have forgotten what God is really all about, what I really want. He says, look, I want to make it plain. Whoever offers praise, glorifies me and to him that orders his conversation aright i will show the salvation of god that's it that's it the two things i really want from you praise me and order your conversation right live a life that will be pleasing to me in the easy reading he says this whoever gives a thank offering shows me honor the stuff that you give that was prescribed you know your 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 tithe or your tenth that was expected. But God says, when you give me that free will offering, when you put something else on top of that, that's where you're giving me real honor. Now you're showing me that you love me. You didn't give this out of compulsion. You're giving this out of a heart response. And it says in the next line, and whoever decides to live right will see my power to save. The one who offers praise glorifies God, not just the one who keeps the public observances up. Psalm 911 said, sing praises unto the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. And it says, declare among the people his doings. There are people who need to hear about what God is doing and about what God has done. That's declaration. Something has to come out of your mouth. People have to hear and know what God is doing. That's what it means to offer praise to say the good things of God, to tell forth of his goodness, to tell of his love, put his, put his praises on your lips. If you don't praise him, who's going to do it? The Bible says rocks will have to cry out. If nobody has a praise on their lips during COVID, the saints must have a praise. If nobody has anything good to say, the, the church must have something to say. Psalms or 11, uh, uh, Isaiah 12, verse 4 says, In that day you shall say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Again, declare his doings among the people and make mention that his name is exalted. We, the saints, must have the praises of God upon our lips. He says, If you do this, if you praise me, I will show you my salvation. I will deliver you. That means that your deliverance 
is connected to your praises. Some people don't get delivered. They don't praise God enough. They've talked about their problem every day and they've praised God only once during their sickness, during their trouble. Praise God during the fire, during the trials. Talk about his goodness. Talk about his power, the psalmist said. Tell people of his goodness. Put the praises of God in your mouth. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude. God says, consider this. Just in case you become forgetful, just in case you become more religious than reactionary in worship and, and, and spontaneous in your thanksgiving, I want you to know it's the praiser that gives me glory. It's the one that worships me. It's the one that is thankful. He's the one that's going to see all of my salvation. The one that tries to live right, orders his conversation aright, lives a righteous life. You're going to see the salvation of God. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, we thank you one more time for your words to us and all the considerations of the scriptures that we have come to see through your word. I pray that, Lord, this week we will praise you like never before, not just with the shouts we make, but, Lord, with the conversations we have, with the, with the testimonies we call, we recall. Let it be a week of real reflection on the goodness of the Lord. We know that someone needs to hear what you can do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We thank you for testimonies of deliverance, testimonies of healing. Lord, we will share the goodness of the Lord, whether pain is rocking our bodies, whether we still have desires to see family members we haven't seen for a while. We will give you thanks. We will give you praise. We will give you glory. I pray that the spirit of God would stir the hearts of your people to make vows that they will keep Oh God, to make promises that we would keep, to serve you with all of our might, with all of our strength, and to tell of your goodness in the ears of those that need to hear. We thank you, Lord, for bringing salvation through our witness, through our testimony, for pricking the heart of someone today, oh Lord, who would never have known if we didn't open our mouth about the goodness of the Lord. Bless your people today. Bless our pastors. Bless our leaders, oh God, and everyone that will hear this word. We pray they will be blessed in Jesus precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you. I hand over to our moderator. Praise the Lord.